This is episode 99 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, you'll hear about the early years of Joseph Dunninger. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast, your podcast home for magic history. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode 99. My friends, I am just back from having a great time at the Florida Magic History Conference in Orlando. What a great little conference. I had so much fun, uh, very little sleep, but a lot of fun, and I've covered the events of the conference over on my blog. So if you want to read all about it, you can visit themagicdetective.com for my report on the conference. But right now, I want to get into today's topic. I've been wanting to write about Joseph Dunninger for a long time, ever since I first wrote about him back on my blog in 2011. And then shortly thereafter, I heard from his daughter, Maxine. I have been fascinated with Dunninger. Uh, I exchanged a number of emails and phone calls with Maxine, and I learned a lot about her dad. And she put out a book on her father with many great stories, which was a help in a later article that I did. But to be honest, I never felt like I did enough. Never wrote enough of his story because there are so many unknown aspects of his life. So many things not really covered. Frankly, there are a lot of controversial things and I think a lot of misconceptions as well. Now, we all know him for being the One Man Mentalism Act, and I'm going to cover that eventually, but not today. Today, I want to delve into early Dunninger, the lesser-known side of the man, when he was still trying to find out who he was. And I wish I, honestly, wish I had access to the various scrapbooks that Dunninger put together. I have seen dozens and dozens of different scrapbooks offered in auctions. Dunninger clearly kept a great record of his accomplishments. I know he had two daughters. I came across uh, an ad in one of the magazines from Maxine Dunninger when she was selling stuff back in the 1980s. His other daughter recently passed away. And by the way, her stuff is being auctioned off on Facebook. In fact... The third Dunninger auction for her is on February 15th, so in two days or a day from now. I hope uh, if you have an opportunity to to check it out, I hope you'll do that. And I know there uh, there are other scrapbooks that are still in the family. Somewhere I read that um, when Dunninger was alive, he had over 30,000 books of his own. These aren't scrapbooks, but... 30,000 books of his own, is the number of scrapbooks. I have no idea. There are just, I've seen a ton of them. I, they're, they're amazing. I wish I knew where they all were today because it would have made, um, it would have made this particular episode a lot easier and uh, probably a lot longer. But I do have one big question, and I've always had this in regards to Dunninger, and it hasn't, sadly, has really nothing to do with him personally. It has to do with something he purchased from Martinka's years ago. He purchased the velvet couch that Robert Heller used in his second sight act. And I'm just curious if it still exists today. I had asked, uh, asked Maxine about it, and she didn't know anything about it. So maybe the other daughter had it, or maybe it was gotten rid of when Dunninger was still alive. I don't know. Uh, Maybe it was trashed a long time ago uh, because somebody didn't realize what it was. Anyway, if you've got any information about that particular thing, I would love to know. And now on to today's podcast. Joseph Dunninger was born April 28th 1892 in New York City. His father was Nicholas, and he was a Catholic from Bavaria. His mother was Jewish. Her name was Coralina, or Lena for short. He had two brothers, Maximilian, who would grow up to play violin for the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, 
The other brother was Louis, who would become a painter but died a tragic and unexpected death at only 21 years of age. At the age of five, Dunninger saw a street magician doing magic, and this was his initial peek into the world of magic. He soon began to demonstrate his own feats of magic via sleight of hand. All the bios that I've discovered say that he was self-taught, though a little bit later he would start buying magic books and devouring all of them, getting as much information as he possibly could. At the age of seven, he was invited to perform for the local Masonic Club. He went by the moniker Master Joseph Dunninger Child Magician. The Linking Ring, November 1951, shares a fun story that happened to the childhood Dunninger. The article says that Dunninger was not necessarily the brightest of students, but for some reason he always received 100% on his arithmetic problems. Perhaps he was cheating. So his seating arrangement was changed several times by his teachers. But still, his answers came out 100% correct. Of course, Dunninger never truly shared the method behind this. Instead, he was often quoted as saying, I didn't have to work the problems out. The bright children in the classroom just sent me their thought waves, and consequently, I got everything right. In 1904, when Joseph was only 12, he and his mother and two brothers just boarded the P.S. General Slocum Ferry in New York City. This was a chartered run for the St. Mark's Evangelical Lutheran Church. They were on their way to a church picnic. But before the ferry left the port, Nicholas, who was at work, had a terrible premonition. He left work abruptly and ran to the ferry. He found his wife and boys and had them leave the boat immediately. The boys were none too happy as they were looking forward to a fun day at the church picnic. They all made it off safely. As the General Slocum departed, a fire broke out on board. Rather than head back to shore, the captain chose to speed up in an attempt to make it to the next street and disembark, but that was not to be. It is said that of the 1,300 people on board, a 1,000 people died that afternoon. It was recorded as the worst maritime disaster of the 20th century, until the Titanic sank in 1912. It makes me curious if this mind-reading thing ran in the family. It was said that Joseph, as a child, could finish his mother's sentences and always seemed to know what he was thinking. Though street magicians first got Joe interested in magic, it was the next performance that made the biggest difference. Young Joe saw a performance by Harry Keller at the Academy of Music on 14th Street in New York. It was this performance that solidified young Dunninger's desire to be a magician. At age 17, young Dunninger's reputation was spreading, and he got hired to perform for one of his idols, the inventor Thomas Edison. From what I gather, Edison must have been a fan of magic because he had associations with numerous different magicians over the years. Here's what Edison had to say about Dunninger. Never have I witnessed anything as mystifying or seemingly impossible. Speaking of elites, this same year, Joe was also booked to perform at the home of someone on Oyster Bay, Long Island. That man, a former president, was Theodore Roosevelt. The Roosevelts were big admirers of Dunninger's performances. And Roosevelt wasn't the only president that Joe would perform in front of, but he was the first. In 1910, Joe appeared in the Sphinx magazine, August issue. Here is the write-up. Joseph Dunninger of the mysterious Dunninger and Company is presenting one of the finest and most mysterious magical acts upon the vaudeville stage. He presents a number of original tricks and illusions in his act and is the inventor of a large number of others, many of which will appear in the Sphinx. He enters dressed as a Chinaman. And after going through a number of oriental mysteries, he holds up a large cloth in front of himself, and for a moment, he drops the cloth, and now he is dressed in evening dress, and all traces of his Chinese makeup have completely vanished. 
He then presents a number of really mystifying tricks and illusions. In one, he causes a large ball to float from hand to hand and then into the audience. He concludes with his own illusion, the Hindu flight. I also mentioned Joe was on the cover of the July 1910 issue of The Sphinx, but apparently didn't get that bio that I just read. He didn't get it in on time, so it was saved for the August issue. But he still had two tricks that appeared in the July issue. Uh, One was a clever coin vanish, and the other was an illusion with uh, three rather large illustrations. That gives a little peek into Joe's act, but here is another. This comes from The Sphinx, February 1911. The audience was given more food for thoughts by the wonderful exhibition of magic and necromancy presented by Mr. Dunninger. The colors of handkerchiefs changed by mere touch of his fingers. Rice changed to water at his command. A large crystal clock, free from all mechanism, was caused to answer various questions in the most mysterious way. One of the illusions presented by Dunninger that caused quite a sensation was that of causing a large ball to float through space over the heads of the audience without any visible means of support. After passing a solid hoop over the ball to prove that it actually levitated, he then caused it to vanish completely while suspended in mid-air. Various cabinet tricks and illusions brought the evening's entertainment to a close. In another article, same magazine, we find this quote, Dunninger is a king with cards. We should say in the same class as Knight Leipzig. He performed many new tricks and most baffling illusions. In 1913, Dunninger was 21 years old. He had a good reputation as a magician doing stage magic, illusions, and more. He was hired to appear for a year at the Eden Musee in New York City. The Eden Musee had originally opened its doors in 1884. It was located at 55 West 23rd Street and was famous for its wax figures and family-friendly offerings. Many performers had appeared there, including the famous Indian chief, Sitting Bull. But magicians had performed there as well, no less than Bautier de Colta and Frederick Eugene Powell. At one time, the Eden Musee was the go-to place to perform. Located near Madison Square Garden, it was a booming entertainment district. But after the turn of the century, much had changed. The entertainment district had shifted and now was near Broadway. Only one other theater remained nearby, and it would close in 1915. The Eden Musee itself would also close in June of 1915, so Dunninger was one of the last popular acts to perform there. And his was no small contract. He was booked to perform the entire year at the Eden Musee. The mysterious Dunninger was now a legitimate hit. But he hadn't quite found his niche. He was doing stage magic, illusions, escape, a little bit of everything. For illusions, he had a hanging cabinet in which an assistant vanished when he shot a starter pistol. And then a previously shown empty cabinet would produce that same assistant. Another illusion was producing a woman from a raised platform. And finally, he had something called the Flight of the Knight Rider, which I believe may have been some sort of transposition illusion. But his big effect was that floating ball that I mentioned before. Interestingly, I found an ad in the Sphinx magazine for the Dunninger floating light bulb The ad was by Burling Hall, so I wonder if Dunninger changed the ball to a light bulb at some point. Following the Eden Musey run, Joe was picked to do a tour of the Keith Albee vaudeville circuit. In the book Daddy Was a Mind Reader by his daughter Maxine, she says that Joe started doing mind reading on his vaudeville run, but I don't think this is totally accurate. At least it didn't happen quite yet. He would eventually, but at this time he was still doing the magic and illusion. In fact, listen to this. 
He starts in November 19, 1915. Dunninger begins escapes. He's using them as publicity stunts. In this one, he's locked into a number of cuffs provided by the police in Peekskill, New York, and escapes in a few seconds. He gets a letter to certify that he did this escape from the chief of police. Obviously, he's taking a page from Houdini's playbook. December 6, 1915, Bridgeport, Connecticut. Dunninger allows the detectives to lock him into a variety of cuffs, and he quickly frees himself. Again, there is a letter to certify that he actually accomplished this escape. I don't know the date on this one, but it's likely from the same time period. Dunninger decided to hire a publicity agent. He wanted to get some press for his upcoming gigs. Dunninger left it to the agent, who came up with this newspaper headline. Dunninger jumps off the Poughkeepsie Bridge while in handcuffs. Now, when Dunninger found out what was uh, supposed to take place, he was livid. The last thing he wanted to do was jump from a bridge, handcuffed, but now he had no choice. The agent assured him it wasn't going to be an issue. Fast forward to the day of the jump. A very nervous and half-naked Joe Dunninger shows up at the bridge with handcuffs and leg irons preparing himself for the jump and likely thinking hard on his career choice when the police show up out of nowhere and stop everything. They made Dunninger stop the jump. The question soon became, who tipped off the police? Well, the publicity agent called the police and warned them that some crazy person was going to jump off the bridge to commit suicide. As it was, Dunninger got the publicity, and he never had to jump. February 5th, 1916, Dunninger escapes from a variety of handcuffs in front of the chief of police in Perth, Amboy, New Jersey. He gets a letter from the police chief again to certify he did the escape. And then September 22nd, 1917, Haverstraw, New York, Dunninger escapes from handcuffs and the jail. Again, a letter to certify from the chief of police that the escape was done. So all of these stunts are done to promote his vaudeville tour. It's unknown what Houdini thought of this. However, listen to this next story. Di Vernon tells a great story about Dunninger, and this comes from his column, The Vernon Touch, that appeared in Genie Magazine, March 1989. As Vernon tells it, years ago in New York, Dunninger and I both worked for the same agent. Her name was Frances Rockefeller King. She was the best society agent in New York, and the reason she handled Dunninger was that at one time, Houdini was booked to work for a Mrs. E.T. Stotesbury in Philadelphia. It was a milk fund show, and Houdini was going to entertain them. Well, Miss King got a very large fee for him, but at the last minute, Harry Houdini called her and said, I'm sorry, I'm going to Chicago, and I cannot fill the engagement. Miss King was having a nervous prostration because at the last minute, he let her down. She called up Joe Dunninger, who she hardly knew, and she told him her problem. He said, yeah, I can do it. She said, you can't fill in for Houdini. And Joe said, yeah, I I have a lot of leg irons and handcuffs. Well, anyway, he went to Philadelphia. Now, he didn't have uh, that uh, cabinet that Houdini had, the big velvet-covered cabinet. So here's what he did. He got some people up on stage, up on the bandstand, and he had them hold up sheets of newspaper in front of him, kind of in a circle, to hide him so that uh, this was the covering he used to escape from countless leg irons and handcuffs, and he really filled the bill. Miss King received her fee, and after that, she was enamored with Dunninger and gave him a lot of bookings. His fee jumped from a few hundred dollars to as much as $1,500 a week. Now, I'm personally fascinated by Dunninger's escape. He has numerous photos of him in front of jail cells, strapped with many handcuffs and leg irons. There's a photo of him in a straitjacket. 
But the most surprising one is an illustration, which is, it's a copy of a Houdini illustration that I know is in the Doug Henning um, book on Houdini. Um, and it says in, in, in that illustration, it's Houdini hanging upside down and this, uh, the, um, the water torture cell, and it has his name next to it, Houdini. But there is the exact same picture, or illustration, I should say, uh, with not the name Houdini, but the name Dunninger. Again, someone hanging up sound, upside down in a water torture cell. Uh, and there's also a picture of Dunninger there. So I'm very curious where that came from. I don't know if uh, Joe Dunninger actually had a water torture cell or not. Um, I tend to think he didn't because Houdini was extremely protective of this particular escape. Also, during the 1915-16 time, uh, Dunninger teamed up with another performer named Devlin earlier in his career in 1910 or slightly there before. Uh, Dunninger was doing an act called Dunninger in Winston, which was a comedy magic act. So on occasion, he would team up with others. It's likely during his vaudeville run, this is when he saw the Fays. This was the mind-reading act of John Cummings Fay and Eva Norman. It was basically the stolen act of John's mother, Anna Eva Fay. But stolen or not, they were making a big impression in vaudeville, and Dunninger saw them. Now, this type of act, this mental act, was always a two-person affair, but in 1921, Joe Dunninger began to introduce feats of mind reading by himself. Except during this time, these were used as publicity stunts. So he would read the mind of some famous person and he would use that for publicity. At a private event in 1924 on a houseboat for Rodman Wanabaker, a Philadelphia department store millionaire, he read the minds of all the guests, including the future Duke of Windsor, who happened to also be on board. What's most interesting about this is a few years before, Dunninger, when not doing magic shows, was actually working for Wanamaker's department store in New York City, stocking shelves. As late as 1925, Dunninger was still doing the big show with magic and illusions, it appears that he was doing the magic and mentalism only for more exclusive events. But word was getting around about his one-man mentalism feats. In fact, listen to this stunt that he would often use for publicity. He would have the client hide a particular object. And then Dunninger, being blindfolded, would find the borrowed object. Again, this was used for publicity. By 1927, Joe Dunninger knew his future was in mind reading. Soon, most of the magic, not all, but most of it, would take a back seat to mentalism. And friends, that's going to do it for the first part on the life of Joseph Dunninger. At a later date, I will follow up and share the rest of his life his mind reading career, how he became a celebrity performer, doing radio shows and even TV. My friends, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. I want to remind you that uh, the Magic Detective t-shirts are still available. Every purchase helps to defray some of the costs of producing this show. So in other words, every t-shirt helps. Just go to magichistorian.com to get your t-shirt. And I also want to remind you that the next episode will be episode number 100. Can you believe that? 100 episodes. I can't believe this is the 99th. It just boggles my mind. Um, I may have uh, some special surprises in store for number 100. We'll just have to wait and see. Until next time, I'm Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective. Please be well and stay safe.